Hello and welcome to the PD Performance Podcast. Today's episode of the podcast is with Westmead footballer Ray Canellan. Ray has previously played in the AFL and the VFL down in Australia and he is currently undergoing the club season with Athlone. So we talk a lot about the club season, we talk a lot about the inter-county scene, how he fell out of love before with the game and how he's fallen back in love with the game now. We also talk a lot about honesty, about mindset, about mental health. So a really, really enjoyable conversation for you guys remember if you enjoy it please remember to like it share it and send it ray how's it going not bad yeah after a big rig roll there trying to get set up but we're set up and we're ready to go and uh it is a tuesday for you yeah i have a decent amount of work done previously what are you facing into the rest of the evening and what's the plan for the rest of the week yeah um plan for the week really uh we've got a game this weekend um so i'm going to be heading back down t- for training this evening um back to athlone and then same again thursday probably go home thursday and stay back in athlone for the weekend play our last group game um of the championship um we're in a position now where we're we're safe um from kind of relegation but we probably need results to go our way to get into a quarter final so all we can do really is try and get a win on our end and then kind of hopefully things fall fall into into place for us then after that I was looking at results and it's kind of been up and down first two games lost in the championship and then two big big wins like in terms of monumental ones um you were playing division two league though yeah. and then in the senior championship so what has been the difference then in terms of coming from league into the championships because I saw you did quite well in the division two league yeah so the lads, in fairness, now I wasn't really involved, just haven't been with Westmead. Um, we've got quite a young squad, and the Division Two was was great in terms of bringing bringing younger guys kind of a little bit up to speed. But I suppose it's still that step off um, kind of senior championship um, in Westmead. So I think the biggest contrast is just you know the the pace of the game and the physicality when you're going from kind of Division Two in your league into into senior championship. So. Perhaps it was that kind of step up that just caught boys out a little bit. Um, and as I said, it's qu- quite a young squad. Like we've a fair fair chunk of guys who are still kind of 17, 18, 19. Um, so, you know, as kind of talented as they might be, there's still obviously the physicality um, jump that, that comes in with, with senior championships. So, as you said, our first two games, um, two fairly poor performances, really. Um, there wasn't really much good to say about them. Um, first one in particular was quite bad. And then second one, kind of showed bits that we were maybe not quite as bad as what we what we what we showed on the first day um and then yeah our next two games we got we kind of got two two good results where we we ground out the first one uh sorry the third one and then um our most recent game against Mullingar Shamrocks was probably the better side overall um we were losing by two points with a minute left and there was a high ball into the square and um there was a bit of an error on the keeper's side that just led to it led to a goal so Lucky to get the win, but you take them in whatever way they come, really. <laughs> yeah, it's how you frame it, though, isn't it? Like, because you have to put yourself in the position to lob that ball in, and in a position in the game that a bit of luck will go your way. So yes. it's never wholly on the side of luck. But no. what did you see then with that younger squad when it came to championship time? As you said, the physicality goes up, the intensity goes up. Did you see in them that? maybe the occasion got to them a little bit in terms of um playing maybe for some of them their first yeah. feature in a senior championship game like yeah and it would have been a debut for for a good group of them either off the bench or, or starting and ah uh, yeah there was there is definitely cause, you know i remember you know myself years ago and there is that kind of the nerves that weren't there all year are suddenly there and you're kind of going in probably more of a tense kind of state of mind so you probably don't flow as and get into that flow as easily as, as what you would have in previous games so oh yeah you definitely definitely would have seen that and i've noticed then in training over the last number of months how um those same guys that may have been kind of apprehensive or nervous are then kind of coming out of their shell a bit more in training which which is great but to your point on i suppose the look um kind of argument um i remember coming in after the game and just kind of saying to the guys so one one thing that had been quite poor we've got we've got an extremely good manager who's you know at an inter-county level of kind of detail and game plan um and i see the the comparisons between what we do with me with westmead and what he's trying to implement with athlone and it's kind of good to see that level at, at club um but i suppose what kind of separates then like inter-county and club a lot of the time is decision making and like 
a, a, a decent club player to an excellent county player, 90% of the time, the, it's the decisions you make kind of under pressure is what kind of separates the, the good and, and the elite. Um, so what was kind of frustrating with, with the club is that sometimes the guys who are, who are good at football and, and skillful and have all the attributes just lack that bit of decision making. And when the plan has been put in place for weeks and weeks and weeks by our coach, and then we were falling away from it in those first two games, um, when when the game and the situation led to what kind of would have been textbook for what the coach was putting in place, you know, was set up perfectly for us, we would then kind of fall into bad habits and bad decision making. Whereas in that last game and that bit of luck, we didn't fall into those bad decisions. We we held the ball properly the way we were kind of been coached to do. And as you say, you give yourself the opportunity then to be lucky. And it's just funny, the more the more often you do the right thing, the more often you're going to kind of get those kind of lucky breaks in games. Um, so that was that was actually quite a kind of, a, 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 I suppose, a good learning point for kind of young lads to show them that, look, stick at the, trust the process kind of thing. Stick at it, stick at it, stick at it. And then eventually you just kind of get lucky. Like That's exactly the word I was going to use to describe it. It sounds like there was some actual learning or a level of learning in those first couple of games, which doesn't always happen because... Maybe it's the benefit of working with younger players is they are a little bit more moldable. Whereas, you know, sometimes if you're playing with the guys that have been playing and around the block for quite a long time and you're implementing a new system and you play two games and you lose the two of them, they can be inclined to, well, this isn't working. Yeah. Let's go back to what we used to do. Yeah. Just lob it in on me. Um, so that is the benefit of playing with kids. And then from you now, like at your level, your late 20s, like, you can probably see how this group is going to go from strength to strength in the next few years. And you want to be a real leader in that development and in that transition as those young players that are coming in start to take on more leadership roles akin to what you're doing currently. Yeah, definitely. Well, as, like late twenties now, like, I mean, like I'm, I'm 29 now and I, I don't know, like, you know, how long I'll be playing football for after, like in the next few years. So hopefully those, those kind of young lads can, get the leadership skills up and running pretty quickly but now look it's it's important that we do have we've got enough kind of older guys in our club as well like it's fair we do have that mix of of youth but we definitely have enough older guys there that um like i'm as a, as a county footballer you're quite disconnected from the club for quite a lot of the year um and it can be very difficult to come back in and, and try and be a leader when you haven't really been involved in especially with success with Divi winning a division two this year um you know you don't want to come in and kind of be too abrasive in in I suppose your approach and you know sometimes that can be something I, I would struggle with because I suppose you come from the county setup where standards are high and then if they're not quite as high naturally in a club setup uh frustration can lead in and that's definitely something that I kind of struggle with is not getting kind of frustrated with you know it's just simple simple mistakes that just don't happen in, in a county setup that kind of do in a club um but you find I always find then as say if I'm back kind of two three four weeks then you kind of you you mold your approach back into kind of dealing with like the I suppose the the club players and like trying not to be kind of critical of of, of simple kind of errors or whatever. Um, but yeah, no, I think we are in a strong place. To kind of ho like hopefully, I don't want to say anything and then jinx us and we end up having a crap year next year or whatever. But like you would hope that with the the kind of age profile that we have and the talent that we have, that hopefully everything going well and we we kind of be in a strong position kind of next year to build on the bit of success we've had through the league um it's been a bit of a disappointing championship but kind of you know if results go our way we could end up with a quarter final chance fingers crossed um and then you kind of you never know what you never know what happens with, with young guys then get a bit of confidence and and see where they go from there yeah it'd be great for them to get into a quarter final but one thing that stands out to me there from what you've just spoken about is it sounds like you mold your leadership styles slightly differently to when you're in with the county versus in with the club is that the major difference is with potentially the county if someone's making an error or not aligning with the values of the team or, or not uh putting in the required effort which doesn't really happen at county level let's say um but is making simple errors you're not one to mince your words you'll put it straight to them whereas maybe you're putting it in a more digestible kind of way when you're at the club level is that a difference or is are you conscious of that or does it just happen um i suppose it, that that's not really a, a role i find myself taking on with with westmead as such um with westmead like if ever i'm 
I think my, my input to West Meath would generally be more kind of like tactical if we're, if we're in the middle of doing something in a drill and I know there's something I'll say it um, and generally it's not kind of um, in, re- in regards in, in regards to standards unless unless we're having like a, a shit start to a session where like you know maybe it's, things are a bit lax but generally it won't be myself um, who'd be kind of you know delivering out that that message um, I wouldn't really feel like I'm in the, the position to do it or it's um, I suppose if we just have such strong leaders outside of myself that I just that's not something that I would I would really uh, take on myself whereas I suppose coming back in with the club as as the only county player um, one of the older guys kind of more experienced I suppose that's where that leadership kind of automatically does kind of fall onto you a little bit and you, f- you do feel that I suppose um, but then with the club do you choose to focus more on tactics then because that sounds like that's more of a strength of yours yeah it well with, with the club it's it's just more kind of like it's i feel there's more you need to be onto people more about accountability at, at club level because at, at inter-county level like you're getting the guys coming to train and who are kind of at that very high level whereas at club level it's just not quite there so sometimes like if more of the kind of conversation you'd be having the tougher conversations would more be about kind of uh, like your application and your attitude and training so we can go out and we can start training with the club and if, if standards aren't there that's when I'll be like right boys like fucking pull up your socks here like we've had four drop balls in the last five seconds of a hand pass drill here like do you know so that's kind of where you'd stand in but then also try and as we said about like you're trying to deliver a message and we spoke about before we were chatting uh, on the mics but like been able to deliver a message and make it make sense to, to guys so stuff that I would have gone through with at an inter-county level that would seem basic to me might be a completely new idea to someone at, at club level so you're trying to then almost encourage that a bit more so yeah I suppose to, to answer your question a long way like your your style of and your approach does change based on where you are and who you're speaking to purely based on I suppose the experience of an inter-county and a, and a club player so different um, and their knowledge of the game can be can be quite different so um, you, you need to kind of change it towards the kind of I suppose the demographic of player you're you're speaking with. You've spoken in the past about how you at one stage kind of fell out of love with the game a little bit. Mm-hmm. Was that falling out of love with the game full stop, or was it falling out falling out with the inter county game versus the club game, or was it just maybe a little bit of mental burnout from putting so much in over so many years? Um. And then to follow on from that, sorry, but. It sounds like the tactical side of the game is something you actually very much enjoy. Yeah, I, I do. I, I do like the tactical side of it. I think it's. I think it's interesting. I like when you're in a training session and lads are nearly killing each other because the training session it, it's frustrating because you're you're working on something that's not working. And I, we've had sessions with me where like boys are fit to box the heads of each other because something is not working, and we're like what the fuck is going wrong here like but then it's like you, you come away from it in the next session then things just click and I love that feeling of oh we're getting onto something now kind of you know this this is working for us and then you see it in games and I do love that side of it um in terms of falling out in love with the game I think I think that'll pro- probably stem from kind of COVID and like the, the bit of time off and, and the freedom that kind of COVID gave although we were locked down and stuff it was far much more freedom in terms of my time which is something I haven't had in since I was 17. Like, so um, I think that kind of just led to a little bit of a, of a kind of like a perspective change. Um, my personal life changed completely. I was, I met my girlfriend, Lucy, um, and all of a sudden, like I, you know, wanted to spend time with her, um, which, which was something I never had previously. And then my whole family dynamic changed. We, all of a sudden we had, a grand my brother had a child so it's a grandkid involved so my goddaughter um so my perspective of life kind of just seemed to change a little bit and it was like the thing that I devoted so much of my time to just started to feel less important in a way um and all these other things like building relationships like with either Lucy or with family and stuff and obviously with COVID spending so much time with family that grew even more um so I think that just shifted my my focus and my perspective and then I just really started to not enjoy training as much. Um, whether I felt I was getting in the way of living my life a little bit, I think that was when I was like, oh, I'm just I'm fed up of it. Um, 
And when you, it's funny when you asked me earlier just about like, would I be the one kind of cracking the whip at county training? And I, I wouldn't be in a position to do it. Like that's probably based off the fact that like, not last year, but the year before. So Jack Cooney's last year. So the year we won the Talchon Cup, like the start of that season, excuse me, no, it was actually the, the season previous to that. I would have, I would have basically like I had had Jack Cooney kind of text me like here what's your what's your story like I was making excuses to not go training which is something I never done before I um Kevin Maguire the captain like at one stage text me but like look what's, what's your story what's your commitment here this year like um and like the only answer I got was just I just didn't really love it like I, there was no I had no great want to be there I had no desire to be there and it took it took a fairly frank kind of conversation with Jack himself where we just spoke about like kind of potential um you know, where he highlighted a couple of games that I would have played um, when he was involved. We, we played a game down in Cork um, where in the first half, I think I'd scored three points in the first half and was probably playing the best game of my life. And uh, he just highlighted kind of moments like that where he's like, when you want to be in, when you're kind of in the right place, like you're as good as anyone. So he just kind of made me focus on what do you want your career to have looked like in, in five years time, 10 years time. And is it going to be the kind of Ray Canellan who was, who was an excellent player when he wanted to be, and then just, you know, retired, or is it going to be kind of the guy who kind of maxed out as much of his potential as he could have? And I, th I think that kind of had a bit of a turning point in myself where, um, I need to kind of be like, right, what, what do I actually want here? Like, do, do I want to kind of keep playing intercounty football? And after kind of conversations with like myself, and my family, um, where I was kind of adamant that say the year of the Talton Cup was going to be my last year it kind of just turned out that I kind of did want to keep going and I don't really know what I would, what else I do with my time after it so um yeah it was some kind of difficult enough conversations to have and kind of very introspective conversations in terms of what I actually wanted myself um but yeah I suppose it was the commitment and and the and the the break that I had with COVID I kind of almost was seeking seeking that again a little bit like it sounds like it was necessary for you to go through a phase of your life when you thought football is not important for you to realize that, okay, it is important to me, but it's probably of equal or lesser importance to these other parts of my life, which I didn't give enough time to previously. Because it sounds like in your younger 20s and, and before that, and probably as a cause of being a professional athlete, it was very much like streamlined, like black or white, this is it. I'm going to be the best that I possibly can be and everything else can take a back seat for these yeah. few years. But then you've realized that it's not about one thing or the other. It's about being a little bit more well-balanced because if you're fulfilled in your personal family life, then you're going to be probably a better footballer as a result of that. Yeah, definitely. And I think... I think a lot of it as well as as a youngster in college like I was doing an arts degree in Galway um and like football was all I had to think about like I had no I had no commitments I had no responsibilities I had nothing like it was just all I had to worry about was how I got trained on a Tuesday Thursday and so much of my identity was just wrapped up in football it was like that's all I kind of was and that was like and I and I I liked it no issue with it. it was great so at that time it suited but then there was such a kind of dramatic shift and Obviously, I started working here at Hope Spot, and obviously, all the relationships that kind of built after that. It was kind of like just started to realize that I actually had more kind of outside of football. So I suppose it just diluted the importance of football in my life, and I think all of that came at a time with kind of co coming out of COVID, where I got a bit of a glimpse of not training as much and actually kind of enjoyed a bit of a break. So I think it all just kind of came to a point where like I needed, I just needed time to, as you say, to have that kind of experience of. A realization that it's not it's not everything um but then also work out in my own life how to balance everything um and that was you know something probably took that year or that that preseason kind of in football to, to wrap my head around is how to how to balance everything and kind of come to terms with you know you're not just a college student anymore you've got you've got work pressures and and opportunities and work you've got your your girlfriend um to worry about you've got your family and stuff to worry about at home you know you're I moved up to dublin and stuff so you now you've got a commute that you never had before so you know it's just all these different things that i suppose just needed to kind of come to terms with and, and learn how to kind of manipulate your time in, in the right ways so that you're not uh 
so you're not robbing from one to, to, to pay the other if that makes if that makes sense 100 percent. and i think it's something we're getting better at in the ga now is all in doesn't mean all in 100 percent of the time it actually just means all in when you're present and you're training and you're putting it in and you're doing the things around that to fill your cup both from a recovery perspective like your nutrition your sleep your hydration all of those mm -hmm. physical things we think about but it's also about what are you doing in your personal life when do you stop thinking about football because yeah. you have to if you're going to come to it 100 percent switched on like every time you come to the field to learn something you've got to have time away from that so that the learning can take effect um, and so you can actually value it yeah. because if it's 100 percent full on all of the time then you're going to inevitably get to a stage where you're like, geez, I wouldn't mind just yeah. having a packet of Maltesers or something. <laughs> right, Why well, go to the movies or... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but do you, like, do you know what I mean? Like, um, And it sounds like even the freedom that you got, and I know you said in relation to training, but I know that training and exercise is something that's very important to you, but it's probably a freedom to decide when and where you train when you're ready to rather than just stop and train and all together yeah like it's that like the training stuff is just i i just know myself like for my own for my own head my own well-being that like just like, being active is something that suits me better whether it's in the gym running like whatever it might be so that's just something that i've always found helps and um and yeah having having that freedom to kind of have it on your own terms is, was definitely something that i kind of enjoyed like throughout, throughout covid and stuff you're you know training kind of basically like you know off your own back which was which was nice um particularly coming off the back of being in australia which was so kind of you know full-on and, and hectic and everything so scheduled and root and routines um so yeah no that was definitely kind of something that i found kind of more enjoyable was having that a little bit more lax time and i just as i said like my life has just expanded now outside of football so much that like I, I don't rely on that as much anymore either like i can go to the go to the movies or something or go out for a bite to eat nice dinner or go for a little weekend away or something that kind of is a nice little reset as well so um i suppose it's just maybe it's just as you get older and i'm kind of in that kind of older group now unfortunately but that's i suppose it's just the the perspectives and like your the importance that you, you put on those things or the your reliance on those things just isn't quite as as heavy as it would have been previously which is actually quite a good thing because if that thing breaks down you've you've got other kind of supports around you that you, you you can rely on so you know back a few years ago if I got injured and I couldn't train you know my whole probably self-esteem and headspace would change whereas now I've got sure I'll self and the missus will tip off and we go do something or we'll pop down and see the the grandkids or whatever it is like so it's just it kind of just it changes kind of kind of everything you're less dependent on on one thing you're in a unique perspective or you have a unique perspective given that you've been a professional athlete and you're playing an amateur sport at the elite level now. What do you think we get wrong as a GA culture that makes it a little bit laborious at times and too full on? What needs to change, if anything? And that can be at club or county level. <laughs> well, you don't get paid. Like, I mean, <laughs> I mean that's, that's, that's one thing. Like, it's not... And not even, I don't mean it from the point of view of like you should be getting, you know, you should be getting paid for it. That's, that's kind of a tongue in cheek comment. It's more, it's more that it's not your, your job to be as committed as you are. And yeah. I think that's what everyone struggles with. Um, and it's, it's what I struggled with so much when I, when I came home, I actually hadn't realized the level of commitment that was involved when I was involved in it. So I, like, I, I wish other inter-county players were got, were able to get this kind of perspective and I'm, I'm blessed to have been able to do it. Um, it sounds obvious, but when you move away or you play a profession sport, um, that is your job and that's all you have to do. So during the day when we're here at work or whatever, you're out playing your sport and that's it. So when you then are done in the evening, you're done and you go home and you, you eat and you chill out and you put on a movie or go get your coffee or whatever you want to do. Whereas over here, obviously you, you work and then you go training and then you try and get home and then you're getting to bed at half 11 12 o'clock at night then you're up again the next morning for training and it's that that grind of it's it's all you're always kind of on um is is what i think is just the that's the toughest part of of gaelic football um it's not necessarily what we're doing wrong is kind of you kind of you're you're you framed it but 
it's just it's it's the most difficult and it's the most kind of unavoidable part of of Gaelic football. I mean, there's no real way around it with the way things are structured unless you're to turn Gaelic football into you know a, a professional sport where it's like it is in Australia or something. But you know that would be obviously changing the game entirely. So that's not really an option. But um, from from that point of view, it's just it's probably the most difficult part and. I suppose like the split season kind of addresses that a little bit. You know, you've got a little bit more of a defined time off and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly it's certainly the most difficult thing that I kind of had to come back to terms with. Is fuck, I forgot that like you have to do everything that the professional is doing, but then you've also got to go to work or college or what look after your kids or whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, I I don't I don't think there's a there's no easy answer to it. And there's no solution as such that that I can really think of, but. That's certainly what I would say is kind of the kind of what's wrong with it and like what makes it so difficult. And I'd say why a lot of lads that you've you've spoken to would say that they've kind of fallen out of love a little bit is that it it is that kind of relentless grind all the time. Do you think we could be more or even the same amount of effectiveness with less time commitment? Like, as in a lot of teams have now moved to the double sessions on the same night. So they're doing their pitch in their gym on the same night. And they might be only turning up to train three nights a week. Whereas previously, even the, I was going to say the inter-county game, but like some clubs, yeah. you could be up there four or five nights a week, yeah. which is a huge commitment. Do you think that's one way that we can not completely overcome the obstacle of the commitment, but at least manage it a little bit? And then give people their few nights off in the week where they can. I don't know why we keep saying go to the movies, but uh, yeah, yeah, have their have their life like yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. I, I think I, d- I don't know what the best way of kind of doing it would be, but I certainly think that you can be as productive if you're efficient in your time. Um, I think it's a it's somewhere the GA is is getting to, but I think the problem with kind of football at the minute is that they're trying to take so much from professional sports. So they're trying to learn, like whether it be from Australia or from the NFL or from the Premier League. And they hear of a good idea and like, oh, let's bring that in. And, you know, you've all these online coaches then that are doing these. And like, you're trying to implement the world, but within a fine window, um, which can kind of lead it, I suppose, to be a little bit kind of inefficient in terms of what you're actually getting done. Um, you know, I suppose you could you could potentially bring in, you know, if if you, the Gaelic Players Association were involved, you could bring in like maximum of three sessions a week for the whole year. There's no no more of these four or five nights a week. Um, you know, stuff like that could could obviously be brought in. Um, I'm sure. I'm, I, I, I'm sure you, you couldn't rule, you couldn't though. police it. No, <laughs> I'm sure. No, no. I'm sure there'd be boys people, training in all yeah. all sorts of spots to avoid it. But like people would think because it's the GA as well as like trying another session a week and we'll yeah. get one up on everybody else yeah. whereas they're not actually appraising the effectiveness and efficiency of the session yeah, like true. they're just thinking like volume yeah. which is something we think all the time i go out and do 50 kicks as opposed to 20, 20 good, good ones, ones like, like yeah 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 well look, i i do i do think that um in terms of like we when we're trying to take in all these different kind of values and different um kind of principles from other sports um that we can kind of, as you say, lose sight of that kind of eff- effectiveness and the quality. Um, so I certainly think that like sometimes training sessions can go on for two and a half hours. And at, at some point you're kind of at the diminishing returns where it's just like, right, we're, we're kind of flogging a dead horse here. Um, it's actually one thing we, we kind of addressed uh, this last season with Westmeath and our sessions were shorter and there were more, there was more energy throughout the session. So people actually just felt better throughout the sessions rather than been stuck on the pitch for kind of two and a half hours which god bless him jack cooney as as good as he was he used to love talking so we get we get stuck there the odd time um for for a little bit longer than than what we wanted but uh um i suppose that's just one side of then trying to like i suppose adapt to to making it more efficient and, and how do you bring everything you need into that kind of more i suppose compact um training sessions like i think that's something you can take from professional sport though because and you've experienced it it's so efficient yeah. like and <laughs> even from like semi-professional rugby like which would be like my background over in new zealand we would do a 15 minute meeting pre-training yeah. and the coach would show three clips mm-hmm. and three clips max yeah. 
and then we talk about them. They'd from, be from the game at the weekend and they might be three different things or they might be three things on the same theme and then we go out and implement them outside. Yeah. Because we'd done the 15-minute meeting, the talking was essentially done. Yeah. So we could just train for 60 minutes to whatever it was outside. Yeah. It would be really high intensity because there would be less talking um, and then the quality would be better we would get more done of higher quality throughout each rep would be better because we'd know what we're trying to learn what we're trying to do whereas i think sometimes the inefficiency comes in terms of the preparation for the session because and like being a coach maybe i appraise it to the coaches but maybe the players I've, and I've seen it with my players. They have taken ownership of it as well of late in that they'll put a message into the WhatsApp group of the things and the learning outcomes they want to get out of the session. And then as a result, there's less time spent talking for 10 minutes. And my coaches, like, they have a pain in their backside from me being like, we're stopped here for six minutes. Like, yeah. I know you need to talk and you need to go through it, but let's go two, three key points and then let's move on yeah. and try to actually train. Because if we're here... Sure, we need to talk things out. We need to connect. We need to learn. But we're also here to train. Mm -hmm. And people have to get home because, as you said, they have work tomorrow. Morning. Yeah, exactly. They have to eat. Like Yeah. Well, that, that's that's it, the same as what our sessions would have started off in Australia. Mm. Um, would have been a, a meeting beforehand and uh, probably like you have a bit more time over there because, you know, obviously mm. it's your job. So that meeting would have lasted a little bit longer than, than 15 minutes. But you would have just ticked off kind of, as you say, kind of, room for improve so our rfis um and just a few little things like that and then a few clips as you said and then the training schedule for that day so the warm-up the drills you're going to be doing the point of those drills the coach that was going to be taking the drills was laid out there just as a bit of a kind of itinerary for the for the training session um and it just felt that you know it gave you structure where you're you were quicker through through the drill through the drills because everyone knew what was what was coming um and i've noticed it's definitely something it's something we do a little bit more with west mead now as well um we'll have that meeting um prior to training try and get all the the chatting done then and then it's out onto the onto the field and and as i said like last year we were our sessions were definitely shorter but i think if you're to look at our kind of you know our quality quantity kind of thing it, we we're definitely probably our output was better um off of less kind of quantity or less time of training which is i suppose what what you're looking for really is to be as efficient as possible 100 percent. and then like the other side of that is Look, we can say less quantity in terms of session duration, but if there's less talking, you might be able to actually get more high quality reps done and the density of those reps will be closer, which if it's later on in the season, it might be more akin and more specific to what the game is actually going to be like. Yeah. So you're preparing for the game, but you can't just go hell for letter like that in preseason. You've got to build up the base yeah. of extensive kind of uh, slower maybe a little bit longer duration, higher volume stuff mm -hmm. so that you can go and chase capacity and maximal outputs down the line. Yeah. And then my thing that I always come back to with the coaches, I suppose, and they hate this argument as well, is at club level, like, if your match is only going to be 60 minutes, yeah. so why are we out here for 90? Yeah. <laughs> like, and I know I have a speed bias, so, like, I'm focused on high quality, high speed, everything at high speed. Um except on our extensive days, but uh, like, it's something I stand by. Like, it, are we preparing for the game or are we just talking about preparing for the game? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's not a luxury that every club has in the country. Yeah. But I think it's a simple principle that if taught to people and coaches around the country, they would be able to implement and they might see some decent gains or returns from. So like, was that something in Australia that really kind of, you learned or you picked up or that amazed you was how fine detail things were around like session planning and explaining absolutely everything that you were doing um in fine detail and the planning around everything essentially to you yeah it's it's just it's it's the biggest contrast really because you, they've got time and resources to go towards it um so i mean like every single part of your day and your body is monitored all the time so like you everyone everyone that who's involved with the sports performance side of the the club knows you know exactly how you are both kind of physically mentally whatever else at, at any given time so and then like your day and your training sessions your gym sessions your nutrition are also planned out um did you enjoy that or was that a bit too much 
given our conversation about the no, it was it was different but like I was, it was part of it it was what I wanted to do like I yeah, wanted to be a pro- at the, I was a professional athlete like. so yeah, like yeah. I mean that is you're there and you're, like, you love it you embrace it and like if there was like do like if there's ever a chance to try something different from like say a recovery point of view I was like yeah, fuck it I'll do that like so like we had like an oxygen chamber in the club like and obviously I've never done that here so like yeah I'll go in there and have like a nap every day and that just because it's there so why not like you've got your they're telling you to go home like. yeah like well that was it and I, you know you your the club was kind of where you spent all your time so you kind of enjoyed it being there and like yeah. these facilities were so amazing that like from coming from a from a gaelic background it's it's cool like it's pretty yeah, cool yeah. being there and being involved in it so that side of it no it didn't bother me like now if if Westmead were getting on my back to that level <laughs> i'd be like oh Jamie. i'd be like would you good luck come on i was like like i i, I stay on top of my conditioning like i'm i'm pretty good from that point of view but like uh i think i think at, at some level like i'm like jesus I'd, I'd be a bit i'd find it hard to kind of commit to it at that again like. yeah it would be a bit overbearing at this level but i don't know maybe that's what separates fucking me from brian fenton and that's yeah. why he's an all-star and i'm not like so maybe that's not yet. maybe maybe that's why maybe that's why that uh, i haven't i haven't bridged that gap but no I, I think i think you need to i suppose enjoy it when it was there and, and i did i like i loved it and i loved kind of experience and how how detailed it was and and the biggest thing to me to your point about detail was just the level of coaching mm. and i mean coaching not from like a not from say a tactical point of view but like a, a a dynamic kind of physical point of view so that if i'm if i'm marking you in say if there's a ball kick down the line um over in australia there's so many long kicks down the line say um so if me and you were kind of in that contest and the ball is coming it's like okay, well, how do I position my body to manipulate you to get you out of the way and that I control the area that the ball is going to fall in and how do you, like, just those, like, you, you put in hours and hours into that type of little technique stuff. So they, we call them craft sessions. So you'd work on your craft every single day for, like, two two hours, like, um, and that'd be either, you know, in, say, the indoor basketball court or um, out on the field before training. Um, and it's control. I it's control. It's very, very low level, um, but, like, like we are easy hand passing the ball like so doing little handball drills you're easy doing you know two three thousand hand passes in a day like it's just if you're if you met one of your coaches you go in and they've got rebound nets off the wall and you come in in groups and be doing certain drills where they're just firing the balls off the rebound nets and you're catching and delivering to a player left or right or behind or whatever so working on that kind of like speed of thought like turning turning kind of like thought out processes into like automated kind of just reactions was kind of just what you're working on your craft and then uh, kind of craft specific to your position over there so obviously they've got kind of key position players who would all be you know six foot six plus and then they've got smaller players so they're not going to be doing the same thing in training for the whole time so prior to training and after training you'll break off into your kind of position specific groups and the talls will go work on say body and then like getting people out of the way to go take big marks and then the smalls it's like myself and the others will go and we might work on when that ball hits the ground mm how are you like they'll have a tackle bag there and how are you positioning your body to win the ball protect yourself and deliver the hand pass to take the ball away from the contest and find your kind of your opportunity to attack so that was the level of detail that i i loved and i thought it was absolutely i loved that coach and i played basketball when i was younger and basketball has that level of coaching from a small age and that was that was what i really loved so aside from kind of the details in like the recovery and the Mm -hmm. gym stuff like i mean that can get laborious the stuff on the field was where i just I, I loved it and the more of it I could do the better in terms of how they run that then because some people will hear this and they'll be like sure they're doing 2,000 3,000 hand pass that training is it very much similar to basketball that the ratio of players to coaches is so low that you can't do out of those 2,000 hand passes you're not able to sway far away from like it being very very good like the quality is always good there's an onus on you to maintain that high quality the whole way through because it might be like for example one coach to five players or something like that yeah. and you're watched constantly and you're cued and you're coached constantly so you can't really drop off because at the same time i suppose if you do drop off like see you later <laughs> back to that loan yeah that's well that that is literally it so that and yeah you're, you're right the, the the ratio is is so kind of close that it's a, it's easier to do it there um but i mean there's nothing stopping if, if you have the drills there's nothing stopping players doing it amongst themselves and then you don't need that ratio of mm-hmm. coach coach to player it's just 
accountability on a, on a player front and that's another side of suppose the kind of club county thing is that you know that accountability with club players like are they more likely or less likely to grab each other and go do a hand pass and drill like they're less likely to do it and county players are more likely to do it so um that's certainly something that i know i know a lot of county teams now and ourselves included would have those little kind of hand pass sessions before training Mm -hmm. just to get your your you've probably traveled just to get your mind on it you're focused on a training session you know you can turn those into fun games and that was the way we always did in australia as well turn into fun games let boys realize right we're at training now relax and then it's just easier to flick from that mindset bang okay lads let's get our warm-up started and let's get going so yeah it's a big principle of mine as well and it's something we brought in this year and it's something that i stole from uh, sarah Rowe, who's playing yeah. AFL out there now or AFLW um, we called them fundamentals yeah. sessions and we do them 15 to 20 minutes pre-training yeah. and it would be a different skill each time and initially it was coach led uh, because you couldn't re- they didn't know what to do yeah. at first they're like well fair I need enough. something to do which is fair enough because we hadn't implemented it yet uh, but then I started to see like rather than coming up to train and five minutes before turning up and then kind of warm up is a little bit lax and we're getting into it they're there 15, 20 minutes before. They're already done their own individual warm-up. And then they've done a little bit of a, a game that, look, players are competitive. So they're trying to win. So it's high quality. So then I just saw that the quality of our warm-ups went up. And then we could get more out of the warm-up. And then as a result of getting more out of the warm-up, when we go into the actual session, we're getting more out of that as well. It's like a mental switch on. And that is something as well that I think in the GA we kind of, sometimes can get wrong not all the time but it's like we're playing for enjoyment like it's meant to be yeah. fun so try and have a competitive edge in those games but make it enjoyable because that's why people are training 100 percent. i think it's something that i've learned as i got older as well is that i used to always play poorly on on kind of bigger days but like with a few exceptions but I, I had nothing reliable in terms of like how do i make myself play well on these days like it was it was a fluke if i did and then as i got older um it's not that I don't care as much, but I suppose, again, it's the perspective of it. Like, I probably don't care as much. Like, I don't, like, it doesn't kill me if we lost as much as it would have years ago. And it, you play with a the freedom then, and I, I find it's just so much easier to find a consistent kind of performance base then when you're not in the headspace of being tense and and kind of it's all or nothing, whereas you're just free and you're playing and you're, you're kind of cruise through. I find that's a, a much more kind of effective approach for me as a, for my personality now than kind of having myself up the walls, like head button doors in the dressing room. Like, you know, you, you get yourself psyched up, but do it in a, in a fun way. And Australia 100% taught me that like every game we played, like it was so casual in the dressing room before games. Like you were, you were there quite early before, you'd, but like there was no big pre-match meeting like three hours before where you'd meet up, have your pre-match meet all together. Like whether it was AFL or VFL or whatever it was, Everyone got to the ground in their own time. Um, there was a minute, be there an hour before, basically, at least. So there's lads arriving two hours, lads arriving an hour. And as long as you have enough time to get yourself ready. And then all before the game, it's music playing, it's high fives. It's, and it was just so different. It was like, it was like, okay, boys, let's fucking go. We're ready. And it wasn't like screaming at each other yeah. as much. So it was just, it was such a different attitude. And I just, I embraced it and I loved it. And it's just, it's something that I definitely kind of stick with now. Like there's, there's a time for that. Yeah. Like maybe for a game, a bit of a, a, a let's go and like a, a motivation. But, you know, for, for me, it's just about staying at that kind of more level, kind of relaxed mindset just before kind of you really, really kind of get yourself wound up too much, like wasting energy. Yeah, you need to play it with a bit of freedom. I think it is something that in Ireland we, we love is fear and having a bit of fear around like this is all or nothing. Yeah. If we don't win this, it's the end of the world. Yeah. Whereas like if you play that way then you play within yourself because you're like oh geez i better not make a mistake like whereas if you see the opportunity and you're like deadly like we might win this we might not but i might as well have a crack at winning it like because like we can win it and then that'd be great uh then you don't play within yourself you try the risky hand pass risky kick pass inside you try something that you've been working on in training you you play the best you play as the best version of you and it comes down to like just a mental framework or something that you can appraise like a mindset and it's yeah. a mindset sh- shift. And I was just laughing because it's something that me and the lads, like when we go out golfing, like the, the boys I'll be playing with, they'd be like, oh, I 
hey, going up to the tee when there's yeah, people yeah. watching you. And I'd be always like, I love going up to the tee yeah. when there's people watching uh, you because that's a different level of fear. I <laughs> yeah, but, but it, at the same time, that. I just tell myself, I was like, these lads are only going to see one shot of mine today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, okay. What an you opportunity them, like, for them to think that I'm Tiger class. Woods. Like, <laughs> and it might be just having a massive ego. But like yeah. at the same time, I find that more of my shots in front of people are good than the lads that yeah, are really okay. fearful and tense. Because you play golf, like yeah. obviously you don't want to be tense at no. all when you're swinging the club. Exactly. No, and it, it is it is. It's the same it's the same concept, the same idea. Like, I mean and aside from that, even your own head, like it's very hard to think of like what what your job is on the pitch when you're worried about making mistakes. So what do you actually focus on? You focus on what you're doing or you focus on making mistakes. And that's kind of where I see like the the biggest freedom for me has come from. I've been able to actually focus on my job, which has turned me into a better footballer, then focused on oh, all of a sudden might make a mistake here. So just frees you up a little bit more in all aspects. Do you think that mindset shift has made you a better leader amongst the club group? Um, yeah, I suppose... Especially for the young lads in terms yeah. of setting an example. It has in terms of like leading by example um, from like in actually in your actions rather than in your, your voice. Um, uh, so it's, it's definitely something like like the first two games we played that we that we lost and I didn't play particularly well. And then I suppose it was that mindset of like, look, you're back to the club now. You need to stand up and kind of be that player that performs. So by going out then and like when I spoke about kind of having consistency in performance there a second ago about... Um, I was a little bit hit and miss in big games. That mindset change for me was, I spoke with a sports psychologist over in Australia and we went through that exact thing of how to be consistent and how come good players are always good players. And it really, it boiled down to what we spoke about was think of the time that you were the best player you've ever been. Like the, like whether it's golf or football or whatever, like the best performance you've ever had. You felt untouchable, you were in flow. Like every pass, every shot, every decision you made was right and it came off and you're unbelievable. And she said, whether that was all in one game or if this happened over the course of a few games where you can piece it all together. She said, now, visualize what that felt like to you. How, how did your body feel? What what did that feeling kind of manifest itself as in, in yourself? And for me, I was able to break that down into like, so when I'm playing well, I'm I, I'm aggressive, like I'm making contact with people. I'm, I'm fast. Um, you know, I'm, I'm stepping away from people um, and I'm I'm kind of brave on the ball. So I'll always bring the ball forward rather than say, sidewards or, or, or backwards so there, there was a few others that we went through but they were kind of the three that I was able to break it down to so by kind of been able to I suppose recreate that mindset and, and know what those triggers were for me to play well it was far easier for me to play better more consistently um, so that was kind of one thing that like I've taken bringing, coming back to the club then is that it's actually through my actions and not through what I'm saying that develops the leadership and if the days I play well with that alone are more likely the days that we will play well together. Um, so there, that's kind of one way that like through leadership as such, it's more through your actions rather than, than what you do. And I find I'm definitely better at, because as I said, sometimes I get frustrated and I can give out in the wrong ways, but you can't give out kind of through your actions. If you just perform yourself well, then, you know, you'll kind of bring boys along with you. And something about that as well is you can trick your body into feeling a little bit better through the actions mm -hmm. so like i've had a similar conversation with one of our players who's a corner forward and we had the conversation about what makes him the best or when is he at his best and he realized he's like i actually feel like i'm playing really good as a corner forward when i'm getting lots of tackles and like turnovers and actually hassling my man so then he identified that he needed to actually have a few contacts if he's making mistakes in terms of shots to bring himself back to feeling good so that he could play good. So something small that he's just said to himself is before the opposition get the kick out, I'm just going to get contact on my man. Yeah. Be that, just touch him. <clears throat> just so I'm on him and so that I'm involved. closer to him and involved so that I can either cut out the pass going to him or if the pass does go to him, I can be on him straight away. So and like for a young man to be that self-aware about his yeah. performance is admirable and he's only going to go strength to strength. But I think some players get that wrong in terms of they think, oh, I'm not really feeling it today. Yeah. And they think that the action is something that happens after the feeling, whereas sometimes you need the action first to then feel the feeling afterwards. And that sounds like something that you've kind of realized in recent years. So yeah. do you think that's led to you 
being more consistent in the last couple of years as a result of knowing that when things aren't going your way, right, this is what I need to get back to, to play better. Yeah. Uh, well, look, I think certainly as a younger player, I probably would have like been more, what's it, maybe flashy. No, it sounds fucking arrogant, but like, I'd be like trying to like every pass, I try and outside the left foot, ping it inside and stuff like that. Um, and you know, it worked most of the time, but I was never as involved in games. Like I would do it every now and then and it would look great or I'd go up and take a big massive kick out, like I'd catch a kick out and it looked great. Like you could put together a fantastic highlight reel after about four or five games. But I think in the last few years, um, like playing in midfield for Westmead, um, it's funny, one of the lads, James Dolan, uh, with Westmead would always kind of slag me about it, about just fucking hit lads and hand pass it off like and it's something that I particularly in the league do you know when the games are a little bit slower yeah. so like people aren't stepping yet I used to, now I just come in and try and hit lads and try and get a turnover and I prided myself over the last few years on having kind of the highest tackle counts out of out of the boys on the team um, and one of the like a few of the other guys then around that middle third do the same so like when you've got your middle third like out hitting guys and trying to get turnovers it just creates I suppose a bit of a an edge to your to your team so and chaos for the opposition well exactly well. yeah because it just makes their life difficult which is what you're trying to do at the end of the day is make life as hard for the opposition as possible so it's something that i've definitely brought to my game more recently maybe it's because i've just gotten like physically i kind of filled out a bit more as i got older and i was actually able to be the person hitting the shoulder here and there um but it's just it was just definitely a way that i was able to stay in the game for longer because you're actually in the game when you don't have the ball rather than have to have the ball to be impactful you can actually focus on right even when the opposition has the ball i can actually make an impact on this game um and it's it's definitely a way that that kept me in the game kept me more consistent and then it just i just simplified i've just simplified my game so much in the last few years i i still will try the the longer outside the boot passes but it's when they're really on um otherwise it's very much either to get it and run um give a one two and try and get it back kind of thing because i can still obviously use my pace or whatever um but yeah, it's it's been able to simplify your game to to make it more consistent that on a day I can go out, I know that no matter what, I'm going to be able to tackle someone. And you can you can build your game off that then. It sounds like you're the epitome of an honest player. And on the RT documentary, I'm fine. Yeah. I heard you talk about your values and how one of them is honesty. Do you think you're more aligned with your values now and the way that you're living than you were when you were younger and as a result of that do you think that's why you're getting the best out of yourself yeah maybe if, to me, it's not really something i think of consciously like I, i'm not i don't know Have if you I'm, ever defined them not particularly like it's it's more i think you know when you're like been a good person or if you're not been a good person and you know when you're playing well and you're not playing well and like i've got like like I can be honest with myself and tell you that like say two seasons ago my commitment was shit and I didn't perform as well as I should have but I can tell you then over the last two seasons my commitment has been there and I've performed better so like that's just yeah that's kind of honesty and kind of self-awareness with yourself but like I don't know if I like it, I would I would hold it as a value more almost like in what I value in others and like then I value in myself as well as the, just I suppose the ability to be honest and like not let your ego get in the way of like saying that that type of stuff about yourself of like holding yourself to account um so yeah it's 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 not something i'm consciously kind of you know aware of in my day to day being honest but it's just something that over time and over the years being honest has has done me kind of has done me well and held me in kind of good stead so yeah it's something that i do i suppose value but i don't know if i'm kind of strict in, in such a way that i'm like oh, these are my values and my kind of core beliefs or something you know i don't know if it's that <laughs> Don't it's that's kind of serious. Yeah, it, it is. It's a bit of a non-conscious, mm -hmm. not just I suppose the same as everyone. Like you you value that in people. Like you you, know, you won't be friends or you won't marry or you won't go out with someone who's a, who's a liar. Like yeah. so it's that honesty is like it's a kind of a an attractive thing to to be yourself and to to have in others as well. Like But you've said there about being honest with others, but you also touched on being honest with yourself. So a big part of that documentary was obviously you going through your your mental health struggles when you were younger and probably not being that honest with yourself and kind of thinking like there's something off here but i'm just going to kind of ignore it as much as i can i'm not going to address it immediately because it is anxiety inducing to address it yeah. so like in relation to being honest with yourself do you find that that's something that 
kind of leads to your mental health being more consistent nowadays is you know when you're not being honest with yourself and you can anchor yourself back to who the real Ray is. Yeah. Well, like I, I know, say when I was telling you about like making up excuses to not go training, like like I was basically lying to not mm. go training and then I'd feel shit about myself and it would later, I remember Jack Cooney ringing me one day and I was like, oh, fuck's sake. And like, you don't need that. Like that's, it's adding a stress to your life that is just so unnecessary and so like within your control. Like I could have been honest there with myself. I could have just quit and stepped away from it and taken that stress out of my life. Or I could have had that honest conversation about like, right, what do I actually want? And then I figured out what I want and I was kind of on, again, you're honest with yourself and you go back and you actually commit to it then. So yeah, from that point of view, like it does, it, it has such a bearing on kind of where you're at mentally. Like if you live your whole life constantly kind of telling mistruths or kind of cheating yourself, you're always going to feel kind of unfulfilled. Like do you ever have weeks or months where like you're not, really training that well and you're kind of you know you're not but you're not really doing anything about it and you you do slowly start to kind of feel a bit shit about it and for me like like I will go through that kind of every kind of off season like I'm probably coming to the back end of an hour where I need to get back training and I'm having these conversations with myself like right now where I'm like right come on now you've gone four days here in a row without going to the gym or whatever like pull your finger out and it's very easy to be like ah oh, doesn't really matter I'm not training's not that intense anyway so it's grand but like you have to just kind of be honest with yourself and like look get, get kind of get to the gym whatever it might be so yeah i think i think it is something that like i find as like a value or as a, as a trade it it suits you and it, it helps your mental health and it helps kind of it just helps all your relationships it kind of helps you just go about your day and less stress if you're just kind of doing the right thing and making kind of honest decisions by by yourself so that feeling post training that you've talked about being a feeling of like fulfillment, yeah. do you think that feeling is almost you being like, I knew I should have put that in there and I did put it in, as much as it is, geez, that was a good session. I feel great. Yeah, maybe I suppose it's it's a bit of a kind of pat in the back for yourself. Like you know, if yeah. you if you feel like you should do something and you do it and it's the right thing to do, you're gonna feel good about yourself. So it's, yeah, I suppose maybe it is a little bit of that. I haven't really ever looked at it that way. I've, I've always felt like after a session, if it's a good session, I feel good just because I, you know, that that kind of endorphin Enjoy. release after a big session. Like so, yeah, it's two things could be true. Though. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, hundred percent. Like it's probably just a perspective I've never looked at it from, but it's definitely like it makes it makes sense that like you know you're, I suppose when you're when you're accountable to yourself and then you tick it off and it's like a little win for yourself that you've you've done it because you're supposed to and you've done it well. So yeah, it's pro it probably is. Yeah, a hundred percent. But it sounds like they're when you weren't living in alignment with yourself a couple of years ago, when you were making those decisions mm -hmm. um, to not go train on that, it probably did impact a little bit negatively on your mental health at that stage as well. Not to the same extent as mm -hmm. previously, but we know that it goes in peaks and valleys, like yeah. it flows. Is just being the best ray possible what keeps your mental health more stable now, do you find? And then how do you, what are the actions that you implement yourself in order to do so yeah or the questions you ask yourself yeah i suppose that yeah that thing of just i suppose being your kind of like best self is like it, it can be hard like to be it's, to be consistent in that like and make sure that you're always on the ball whether it be with work or, or with training or personal life or whatever so you know it's hard mine is just to try and like like to ensure that like i'm like mitigating risks i suppose like i'm not letting myself uh like I'm not a big drinker really. Like I do like going for a few pints, like, but like I'm rarely out in the piss until four o'clock in the morning. Like that doesn't, I just get tired and want to go to bed. Like, um, so like, I'm, you know, I'm, the, the kind of risk for me would be like poor sleep, not working out as much. Um, and they'd be kind of the, the biggest things I like, can, for, for me then it's just to kind of make sure that like you're on top of those things. And if you're on top of those things, everything kind of falls easier into place. And as you say, you've ups and downs like week to week, month to month, professionally and especially in this environment of where I work in a sales environment. Like, I mean, everything is incentivized and it's targets and literally you could hit your target on the last day of the month and you're elated and the very next day you're back to zero, start again. So like there is definitely ups and downs where like you're dealing with stresses and stuff outside your control. So for me then just having some techniques, I've got like, say I do like breathing techniques and stuff um, like at in the evening at home or before I go to sleep, like Lucy would be lying beside me and she'd just be like, 
almost half laughing at this stage because she knows if I'm doing it and she'd be like what's wrong with you and I'm like oh nothing and grand she'd be like well you're not because you're doing this <laughs> fucking stupid box breathing technique that you do when you're stressed so like there's no real hiding from it then like yeah. um but and yeah then you have to talk about but it. then exactly it kind of opens it up like and it's funny like she wouldn't be that into it now in terms of like I've ever tried those techniques so like if she's ever stressed I'll be there telling her to do it it's like I, yeah. can't fucking do it <laughs> so um no it's definitely I, I definitely have like techniques and stuff so like i try and recognize the triggers of when something you know might be going wrong and then i've got kind of a lot better kind of handling those those ways of, of dealing with it and i'm i think as well i'm not as uptight as i would have been as a younger kind of kid which which does help that like things that would have stressed me out just don't anymore which is great like that doesn't obviously happen for everyone some people are wound differently than others but yeah. it's growth and it's something yeah. that you've worked on. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perhaps that. So like it is, people are capable of. Yeah. And it's, it's perspective as well. Like, I mean, I don't know why we keep coming back to it or whatever, but I suppose you just learn about the importance of things as you get older, as you say, as you grow, um, some things you value more than others. And back then you may have put a huge emphasis on it. And now it's just, you realize it's not important. And I think something that I've always like I've gone and, and done talks with with schools and businesses and whatever about um kind of my own mental health kind of journey um and one thing I've always kind of said on is like or spoke on is that if you look at the person you are or you were say five ten years ago and compare that to who you are now it is a completely different person nine times out of ten um your your friendship groups might be similar or they may have changed completely your personality your interests everything about you has probably changed in some aspect or some form um, and I always spoken about that in terms of you often hear of of these young guys and girls who struggle with mental health issues and then in what could potentially be like a knee-jerk reaction at 18 years of age will take their own life and you have to sympathize with them and be like it's just such a shame because not only are they kind of taking that life they're also kind of taking the second life of the person that they could have been and if I look back at, as a 18 year old and I look at what was important to me then and who I was then and try and relate it to who I am now and, and the people in my life now and who is important to me now those people didn't even exist like either whether it be my girlfriend or my nieces they they weren't even around like so I always think when if you're if you're young in particular and you're going through those struggles like you need to realize that what feels like everything to you right now is such in 10 years time it's going to be such a minute part of your of your life um and for you then to kind of react in such a way that's so final in terms of suicide it's it's such a i, I think i can't remember who said it, it's such a long-term answer for what is it short a short-term term problem. problem um and it's always it's always one way i've kind of looked at it is that it's these kind of two lives and the, the risk of, of ending two lives rather than just the the one of this child you're actually killing the the future of this happy adult with with good relationships and good values and whatever else it might be it's powerful like and it's so true as well and hopefully if there's anybody listening to this uh it will resonate with them that like there is life after whatever you're going through right now and it's about seeing the opportunity rather than being fearful of what might be or what might not be um so we'll move on to quick fire questions to finish if you're okay with that yeah First one's proudest achievement to date. Um, quick bar, uh, probably going, probably going to Australia or the Tajikistan Cup. Kind of hard. Kind of lucky you through that second. Yeah, it's it's kind it's kind it's kind of hard. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of hard to to separate too. But you're at a different stage of your life with both. Yeah. So like, like if you can't separate the two, then that's fine as well. We'll take two. Don't worry, Ray. <laughs> um, favorite athlete of all time. Um. Messi. Oh yeah? Yeah. Interesting. That was gonna be Desi Dolan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have to meet him during the week, so <laughs> imagine me saying that and then go down and meet him. So kissing ours. Um no, no, I think Messi. I just love I it's right for me, so like I kinda I always like compare my brother John would have been like like uber skillful but small and like diminutive kind of stature. Um whereas I'd be a lot taller and far more athletic. Um, so I would be kind of like just completely kind of different to him from that point of view but I've always loved the athletes that are just so skillful like it kind of goes against who I say I would be as a player whereas I'm more I rely more on my athletics than my skills um, so but I always just someone who's just 
that good at what they do. I just think it's it's insane. Like, and I think he's he is the peak of that. It's something we spoke about earlier. Actually, is like thinking fast in terms of decision making. Yeah. And the really really standout athletes are the ones that can play fast, like yeah. you, and can think fast as well. Yeah. And that's how you get there. Like you can when you're older as an athlete you can still think fast and the body's not quite there yeah, and you yeah. can get away with yeah, it really. and when you're younger and you can play fast but you can't really think that fast you can do a job be it a role job but if you really want to be the player that you're capable of being and the best player possible you got to work on both yeah. play fast and think fast yeah. what's the biggest thing that you've learned in the last 12 months Poor. that's some quick fire question like that's uh-huh. a big quick fire question oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um the biggest thing I've learned in the last 12 months, um, the importance of managing time. Uh, just since starting in here with work, balancing work, balancing football, balancing home life. Um, Lucy kills me because I'm brutal at managing dates. And like I could have something booked in with someone. And if it's not, say, in my phone or in her phone, it's forgotten about. So, Jesus, yeah, managing time is definitely something that I'm, I wouldn't say I've learned because I'm learning. I'm still shy better. at it. Like. As long as it's in her phone. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, has to be, it has to be in someone's though. Like in, we're booking holidays here at the minute. Uh, and I'm just like, oh, jeez. Booking holidays in the GA. Yeah, is. like I'm, I'm all over the place. And that's actually, yeah, that's, you asked me the biggest problem with the GA earlier. That's one of them trying to, the, the changing of, of schedules is an absolute nightmare. Yeah. And it's why uh, the dual players. Oh, they're getting shafted. Yeah, you, but you can't do it anymore really, like essentially, because... You can do it, but you'll be a single man or a single yeah, woman. 100%. 100%. <laughs> uh, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? Relax. Just like, I know it's such a vague kind of thing to say, but yeah, just like, just relax. Like Things aren't as good or as bad as you think they are. So just try and get yourself on a more even keel and chill out a bit. <laughs> Well, you seem very relaxed and you seem to be in a very good place now, Ray. So I'd say that 18 year old kid did listen eventually. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a million for coming on. It's been great. Ah, good chat. Thank you.